Hi everyone, in this video from Count Backwards from 10, we're going to take a look at what shock is clinically. Clearly define some of our terms surrounding shock and touch on the various types. Now, there will be another video, actually a couple of videos after this, that will zoom in on the individual flavors of shock and what we can do about them in the operating room. So the first thing that we need to do is really define shock. I always ask medical students, and we're going to kind of write a, a mock case scenario here. If we have this 70-year-old patient in the emergency room, and we don't know his medical history, but we suspect that he is in septic shock, secondary to UTI. Okay? Now, let's pretend for a minute that I'm the ICU fellow and you're the intern down in the emergency room and you're calling me for a consult. What I ask students to do is to convince me that your patient is in shock and needs ICU level of care. So what kind of things do you think students and interns tell me when I ask them, all right, tell me about why this patient is in shock or why you think so? And I kind of generally get the same answers all the time. I always hear tachycardia, so heart, heart rate's a little fast. Uh, they have a low blood pressure, hypotensive. They visibly look sick, visibly sick. Some say poor skin turgor. Dry mucous membranes. Fever and increased white count. And I always have to say that those are excellent descriptors of what someone who may be in septic shock may look like. The problem though is that it also happens to be a very apt description of what, no, what any normal person with a stomach bug at home who's been vomiting or having diarrhea for two days may look like as well. And that's really the big issue. So these don't really differentiate shock versus just being sick and constituting ICU level care. Therefore, I think it's important to define shock. And I, will, I want to clearly define it uh, the way that I do and kind of look at how other people define it so that we can kind of agree on, on a definition before moving forward. Now, many sources will say that shock is the lack of perfusion to your organs resulting in end organ damage. And I'm going to take that definition one step further and say that it's not just a lack of perfusion, but it's lack of oxygenation. So I look at it as lack of O2 to end tissue. And the reason that I differentiate it like that is that can a person who has a hemoglobin of three but a normal blood pressure be in shock? And the answer is absolutely yes, because despite the normal pressure and the normal perfusion, they're still not getting oxygen, which is really what the end goal of perfusing your organs is, is getting oxygen to tissue. We should also note that it is refractory to volume replacement. And this is important. And there are actually even some conditions, some types of shock where giving volume can make things worse. So as I said, when I discuss shock, I'm looking really at end organ hypoxia, lack of oxygenation to our organ systems, which, yes, for the most part, is a function of poor perfusion, but remains the actual problem, is that, like I said, the perfusion isn't providing what you need, which is oxygen to these organs. So when you give a patient volume and their clinical picture doesn't improve, then we have more evidence that there is shock happening. So when I teach medical topics, I do my best to try and get students and residents alike to stop thinking about things in a medical context and really try to start thinking about them in a common sense, relatable to you as a person in a world context. And we'll go over what I mean by that now. So when we evaluate shock, as we said, the real problem is lack of oxygen to organs resulting in damage and in concert usually with hemodynamic instability. So when you think about shock, all I want you to do is pick an organ and think about what happens when that organ doesn't get oxygen. So let's start with the kidneys. 
as you can see my beautiful drawing of a kidney here what happens when the kidney doesn't get blood well AKI so acute renal injury or acute kidney injury possible dialysis if it's bad enough fulminant renal failure but when you're evaluating this patient in the emergency room you're going to look for your increase in your creatinine and BUN and from a physical exam standpoint these patients do not make urine or they make very scant urine which we refer to as oliguria they may also have muddy brown casts in their urine as severe shock can lead to ATN or acute tubular necrosis and again this is going to be the kind of trend that we follow is we're, we're just going to take different organs and just think about what happens when they don't get blood and oxygen I'm going to do a little racing over here to kind of get some of this stuff out of the way give me a little more room for my bad drawings so next how about the brain I know great drawing of a brain So many times these patients are going to be stuporous, confused, and sometimes straight up obtunded. And again, it's simply because your brain is not getting enough oxygen, so it makes it very hard for it to fire and work properly to keep you conscious. Furthermore, and I'm not going to write this down, but if you listen from an evolutionary standpoint, why would it be good to pass out when our brain isn't getting enough oxygen? And your body's very smart and has had a lot of time to figure this out through evolution. The heart has to pump up against gravity to get blood to the brain. So if the individual stops getting oxygen to their brain, it's beneficial to fall down as it puts the heart and the brain on the same plane, thus making it so the heart doesn't have to overcome gravity to perfuse it. So makes sense. Oftentimes patients in shock will be altered, altered mental status as you'll see it, or just like we said, straight up unconscious. How about the liver? So I hope some of you have heard of shock liver. And in this case, you're going to see very high in the thousands, AST and ALT. As you decrease oxygen delivery to the liver, hepatocytes die and they release their enzymes, which leads to increased levels of them in the blood. How about the heart? Some people say cardiac arrest, but let's kind of take it back a notch and say if you become ischemic to the heart, a lot of times these patients have shortness of breath, chest pain. They can have increase in their tropes and CK levels. And they can have EKG changes, such as ST changes or T wave changes. Let's look at one more. How about the lungs? Uh, my wonderful drawing of the lungs here. It's going to look almost like a PE shortness of breath because it's the same thing you're not perfusing your lungs shortness of breath tachypnea so they're going to breathe very fast and feelings of breathlessness and in part the tachypnea comes because when you're hypoxic your body's response is to increase minute ventilation to try and get more oxygen to your tissues these are a couple of examples but the concept remains the same Pick an organ and be able to describe what happens when it doesn't receive oxygen. So when you're calling the ICU fellow at 3 a.m. for a consult for a patient you believe to be in septic shock, it sounds much better and more convincing when you can articulate these kinds of symptoms than just a generic sick patient. As I mentioned earlier, there are a number of types of shock that we'll get into in further videos. Each will get its own distributive such as anaphylaxis and septic, cardiogenic shock when the heart isn't pumping well, hypovolemic when there's nothing left in the tank to pump, obstructive that you see in pneumothoraces and tamponades and PEs. So that's all for the basics of shock and what it is. As always, if you have any questions or topics you'd like covered, please contact us. Otherwise, check in for the next video.